work for me um and also talk about how i incorporate play in most of my compositions so here's a lovely table of some of my compositions um not the latest ones but certainly the ones in the last couple of years um so and then how they relate to my various conditions so we have from left to right atidrophobia autism and situational oppositional defiance disorder or sodness um, and I'm going to focus on particular pieces as I talk. So the first one I'd like to talk about is related to my sodness, um, which is language is a fictitious fact. For those who are savvy with spelling, you'll notice that fictitious is spelt incorrectly. This will become clearer later why this is. This piece also relates to a lot of my friends and their dyslexia. Um, it was a sort of collaborative project, um, although it was my composition. So here we have a table full of words that I discovered over the course of a couple of months when creating the score. These are words that I either found interesting to hear, to feel in the mouth, like hypnopompic. Don't ask me to explain what that means. I can't remember. Or how they looked on the page. I would then give them an overall rating um, and give some very, very brave friends, all dyslexic, a spelling test and um, there are about 129 words on this spelling test which got smaller of each for each friend um, I paid them in a lot of cake um, and this would then I would then collect these words and find my favorites and I would draw them into a box so this is my first graphic score so on the screen you can see a, a, a kind of diorama of words with paper mache dictionary and words hanging from um, from the top with various on various shapes uh, so if we get closer you see that it's uh, there's a lot of text that one could read in this performance um, the words are hanging so they're in flux in the idea that language is always shifting and changing over time and the words that are you'll see are also drawn so here we have precocious which is drawn how I felt myself saying it so to the pr found it was very much like a short sound um precocious and sh was very much squashed together um you'll also find um some words which are uh correctly spelt are underlined in red when I was growing up I was always given red underline whenever I misspelt a word I don't think that's the common practice these days but that that kind of flowed into the, the idea of wrongness and rightness um, and here we have various friends uh, hanging around this score and they are performing it I'm going to show a little clip in a second but I'd like to say that there are no instructions for this score and I of, I'm often asked what is my interpretation I refuse to give it um, not only is music in my eyes open to interpretation no matter what the composer says it's this score in particular is open for however you want to uh, experience it and here i'm gonna have a little clip So moving on, um, I'm going to talk about my tetrophobia. So I'm going to briefly talk about the performance that was um, you saw or the score that you saw in the concert. The destination is obsolete. Um, so like I said at the end of the concert, this is the music is in the mistakes. I like the idea that it could be wrong, but also right at the same time. This was also sort of inspired by uh, Thomas Johnson's failing score uh, for a uh, difficult piece for solo string bass. This, is, this score is continuously failing as the score gets harder and harder and harder for the performer to both speak and play at the same time. And actually, if you get it perfect, you're almost failing because you shouldn't be getting it right at all. And then thirdly, 
it was inspired by a quote that I heard while watching an episode of Star Trek. Change is the essential process of all existence. And this idea of change, whilst attached to my fear of failure, is strongly attached to being autistic. The idea that there's... I know that change is necessary for things to evolve, but when something changes in a setting that I'm not in control of, it throws my whole day, just throws my whole day out, throws my whole week sometimes. And yet in my work, in improvisation, in my uh, experience as a free improvised, in free improvised performer, this is sort of okay. It's in a setting that I allow the change to happen. So I'm not going to play a clip, but for those who weren't able to see the screen, this is what you, you'd see. So you've got instruction on the bottom left. Um, here we have the pitch A. Along to the right, we have an instruction as how to play that note, which is vibrato. Above that, you have two timers, one which is the total time elapsed, one that is longer and is an indication of how long that instruction is going to last. You've got your start, clear and stop buttons in the center uh, mid uh, top. And then you've got a uh, space bar instruction to the left or button to change the pitch should the soloist desires. A brief description is that the soloist is following these instructions while the ensemble have to guess which pitch they're playing. They're not allowed to see this screen. And I found it very interesting with Leggetti Quartet when they wanted noise cancelling headphones in order to increase the mistakes which is something that you don't normally get in more music or performing arts um and the idea of failing well in that piece there is no way to fail except for the soloist to not play the note they're told to at the time so it's um that's playing against my uh, fear of failure so the next piece I want to briefly touch on is It Takes All Sorts, which was composed um, accidentally in relation to my autism. I say accidentally because I didn't realise that I had given the performers an experience of a mild hypersensitivity to tastes, excuse me, tastes and textures. So here we have... Um, some of the performers from the Scratch Orchestra, blindfolded, and in their hands are some sweets. They're usually jelly beans. And the, the instruction I give them is to take a sweet, smell it, taste it, feel it, think about the flavour, what does it remind you of, what texture is it in your mouth, how does it feel your hand, just experience it beyond normal taste and then vocalize it. I asked them to be not boring. Don't go yuck, don't go yum. If you have to spit it out, make it part of the performance. Really, this was an idea of what happens if I give a performer something that's non-musical to interpret. That was the impetus. But when having um, multiple autistic friends listen to the piece, and having autistic friends be part of the piece, they realised, they, they informed me that I'd sort of given the neurotypicals of the group an experience of hypersensitivity to taste and textures and smell. Because as soon as I blindfolded them, they were, they focused in on the texture to the point a simple jelly bean becomes rough in the mouth because they're almost forced to focus in on it. Um, and one friend said they'd gone off the coconut jelly beans because they didn't realise how sandy the texture was. Um, and this was just post, post the performance. Um, again, I had no idea what was going to happen. A lot of my scores, I don't know what the sonic outcome is going to be. These are games I play with the performers to, to push them out of their comfort zone as I am constantly pushed out of my comfort zone in daily life and I'm going to play a little clip of um, the scratch orchestra performing it so 
very small clip there. You can hear the full one on my website. Um, so the penultimate piece I'd like to talk about is a thought. Now with my situational oppositional defiance disorder tends to come with me questioning authority or questioning rules or questioning I, I have this impulse to question things when I'm told to do something. I could be simply planning to put the bed away and then my husband asks me can you put the, the bed away darling and my brain goes no not now you've told me no <laughs> it's like this impulse I can't stop and the big thing with music is I'm always questioning the meaning that people place on it like why do we have this set meaning for set sounds okay as a society we've tend to agreed on but if I play the McDonald's theme to someone who has never heard of McDonald's what do they think of um, and this piece itself was a polite middle finger up to a tutor who I'm now good friends with, who kept questioning my integrity of allowing performers to to have their own interpretation beyond what I'm telling them. I would actively tell them, don't listen to what I'm asking them to do. What do you interpret on the score? Uh, ex explained better by Sam Bailey, who performs the piece. Can I play this? Each and every one of you hears it as something different. Sometimes these differences are so small, so minuscule. This piece becomes a bit meta and starts questioning the purpose of the piece itself. Um, I will just give some uh, content warning for those who want to go seek and listen to the piece. At the end, there is some very naive language um, where I talk about this crazy composer. It's a bit ableist. Uh, it's a few years ago and I'm hopefully down the line going to work on a new version, just change those words up and get a new recording. So I do apologise if that is... Uh, triggering, triggering for anyone um, but just a fair warning okay so one of the it's not the penultimate I do lie there it, it was the alter the anti penultimate this is the penultimate piece um, which ties in all three of these conditions which are the most prominent now I would just like to take a moment to explain that none of my pieces are about my conditions that's not because I have an aversion to this but simply because I don't want to compose anything that's about my conditions. They're simply utilising my experiences um, of everyday processes and either challenging them, questioning why I experienced that, or utilising it as part of a process. So my obsession with dice comes out in the piece Contingent Extemporization. Um, and the fear of failure as well, as it's a piece which requires the performers to improvise. And with the situation of oppositional defiance disorder, there's this push and pull between the authority of the dice roller at the front telling performers to turn them to stop playing or start playing, or free imp and and free improvisation within their material that they're given. So. On the screen you'll see some pictures of dice, various dice that I possess. 
Um, in fact, this was a pre-buying my D120. That's 120-sided dice, for those who don't know the lingo. Um, I love my dice. So this piece, as I explained, you've got a dice roller at the front, and they roll the dice that has as many sides as there are performers on the stage. So, for example, if there's four performers, you'd roll a, a four-sided dice. The dice roll at the front can control when they roll the dice to change the performance. They then have to signal what number to either turn on or turn off the performer. The ensemble are watching for this signal and they have either at the beginning of the performance or prior to the performance been given the notes or um, sonic um, samples, for example, if they're non-pitch instruments, that they can use or sounds they're allowed to use. They're only allowed up to 12. When they're turned on, they are allowed to perform at any point. This can be a solo. This can be with another performer. Or they can choose not to. But they're only allowed to use the material that they've been assigned before the start of the piece. If they're turned off, however, they're not allowed to play at all. And it's only when the dice roller at the front chooses to end the piece does the dice roller have any say on ignoring numbers. The dice roller has to give those numbers in the order they appear. So you've got this push and pull between control and no control and improvisation and no freedom. You'll hear that the um, the bass singer, he only had one pitch. He was only allowed to sing one pitch throughout the whole performance. And the lucky pianist got all 12 notes. Um, that's just the luck of the role, really. Um, he found it quite interesting to only have this one note to experience what he could do with that one pitch. OK, he did end up accidentally shifting that pitch in the performance. But I have to admit, as a fo fellow vocalist, that's very difficult to maintain one pitch continuously. And I think the whole piece was about 20 minutes long. Uh, this score can be two minutes to an hour, up to how long you want it to be. But to maintain that one pitch and find lots of material for that one note um, was, was just fascinating to, to hear. So... Um, there's a very old meme on this screen, uh, which I regret saying this is, an, this is a conference and I had to search for what it was called. It's If you go to knowyourmeme.com, uh, but knowyourmeme.com, they'll tell you that this meme is called the Salt Bay. And I feel very weird saying that in the middle of a conference, but that's the name of it. So I have to reference it. Um, so the Salt Bay meme is an old meme with um, a chef whose name I forget right now. Fancy sorting, um, I believe it was uh, it was meat on a barbecue. The w words on the on the meme are when you're writing an academic paper and it doesn't have enough fancy words in it. So to the right, you have a phrase that I'm still using in my PhD, which is practice based experimentation, exploring potentiality within or without parameters. Which, quite frankly, is a fancy way of saying play and here we can see the colorful uh, letters bouncing in so the 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 linking theme with all of my pieces or certainly the majority of my pieces is play 
Whether that's me playing with some rules or playing with the performers or allowing the performers to play. So primarily you'll see like um, an arrow pointing from left to right with 100% other control on the left and 100% my control on the right. And this is what I play with. If I want to, to summarize all my pieces, except for those that maybe I wrote for a technical exercise at some point, all my pieces play with control of giving up control or trying to maintain some control in an environment that doesn't have control. And this push and pull, and this idea of allowing performers to play and explore is fascinating to me, to, to, to hear things that I wouldn't have thought about. Now, I apologize for the large quote on screen, but I have had no quotes at all. Um, but this came in while I was creating the presentation and it was just perfect. So Tom Troop is a amateur musician who attended a workshop on the 5th of November 2020. I would just point out that was over Zoom. That wasn't completely COVID safe. And he sent me the, this back, this this quote, this re reflection on the workshop, just so I could put it in my PhD. I didn't ask him to, but it was quite fascinating to read. I'm just going to read the text now. It was instructive, learning by doing, not by worrying the subject with theory, but by sitting in a room, virtual as it may be, and shelling the walnuts. Deeply, deeply meaningful experience. There was, in our sitting down together, no literature review and no agreement on methodology, aside from the fact that all of us have heard some of Jason's recordings and performances before and might have some familiarity with the language we have listened to and so might have some idea how to respond. And their ears and their creative space were open to our response and embraced it with warmth and laughter. No condemnation, no performative requirements, really. This is what freedom looks like what learning looks like. I have no doubts that Jason is saddled as every PhD student is with their own performative requirements, but they were not passing these along to us. And this is remarkable. Instead of worrying us with the goals they need to meet, it was just playtime. And so allowing performers to play, allowed them to explore. I, think I said this earlier in um, the conference in a breakout, allowing them to play gave them the chance to explore something they may not have had the chance to explore to find out those sounds on the instruments that are interesting so the the, the actual final piece i'd like to talk about is more of a project and i kind of put this in this weird line between composition and not composition so adventures and artists the logo on the screen with a outline of a dragon playing a wind instrument with fire coming out of it don't sue me uh uh, wind players this is a, a complete artistic uh, rendition by the graphic designer um, Adventures and Artists is a live Dungeons and Dragons podcast with a musical twist we have the live game going on with live interpretive music or quasi improvised in a concert setting as we can see uh, um, on the top left panel we have um from le left to right uh myself in a dragon hat our our now gm that's a game master um maz followed by uh connor one of our players um nick in who is our dungeon master of the time the mayor and i can't remember who that's next to i have to say i'm really bad at that but uh, the, the mayor of canterbury who opened up the pilot concert series david who's one of our players and Gareth has another players um, and then our old um, assistant musical director Ellie in another dragon hat and down the bottom you'll see those players in the middle of a performance and to the right you'll see our, our musicians Sam on electronics Colin on our on the bassoon and uh, Jacob on our who's our violist this project brings together the, the literal idea of play and also story. So we have Dungeons and Dragons being played. The game is chance based with some interpretive 
role play. So although the GM has some idea of what the plot may be, there is no guarantee when players are concerned. They could go down that third route that you have never planned to go down. They could talk to that non-player character that you haven't actually planned out their backstory for. Or they could do something even more unexpected that I couldn't list off. And then you have improvisation, which is a world which, especially in free improvisation, which is unexpected. Things can happen. Dropping of a of a bow could suddenly create this 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 catapult of sound, um, or maybe the squeak of a chair in the audience, or a cough. anything could happen to change something about what is happening now in the music. And so bringing these together felt to me just just natural and it also allowed musicians and the performers to explore beyond the traditional tonality of interpretation of action so i'm just hopefully there is time i'm aware how close to time is. i'm going to show you a tiny tiny clip I'm going to pause it there because uh, I've got 30 seconds left. So um, here we have lots of uh, original soundtrack album covers. And you can find us at ANA Podcast Bandcamp.com. Apologies for the image description. That's uh, tight on time. Um, so my conclusion. Well, my conclusion really is don't be afraid to explore play, uh, even and especially if it's outside of this, quote, normality, unquote. So thank you for listening. Uh, and there's my website. And um, unfortunately, the Adventures and Artists podcast is um, website is down right now. But um, it hopefully will be up. My tech uh, website technician is typing away trying to figure out what's going on. But it is available on YouTube and Spotify. And if anyone would like to help out with captioning, that would be fantastic because we are struggling.